A rule I live by when it comes to judging horror is that any horror story that relies on a red herring to obscure the truth isn't worth my time. With that established, Man of Madon begins with a red herring. American World War II servicemen caskets are loaded onto a freighter like it's important to the plot somehow, but isn't. Can I fight? Either Charlie is fluent in Chinese, in which case, good for him, or he read the subtitles too. Because nothing about his character says, I'm bilingual. Doom? Wait, what? What does that mean? Hey, what does that mean? Doom is a pretty easy fortune to understand. Big deal? Sure. Tell your friends about me, huh? Charlie understands Chinese as well. So why would this lady's insult go unnoticed because she said it in Chinese? The fortune teller gives the same fortune to both Charlie and Joe. I get the feeling no one walks away from this guy feeling good about their week. The crew load a crate containing powerful hallucinogens onto a ship stored in nothing but burlap sacks inside a wooden crate. Were there no still drums to be found in Manchuria at this time? Hey, where's my... where's my 50 cents? Charlie loaned Joe 50 cents for the fortune teller and boxing game back on the dock. Why would he expect Joe to pay him back on the same night when he clearly has no money? Get this one to the medical room. Throw the other in the bridge. This is a paid actor. The freighter springs a leak inside the cargo hold during a storm and then lightning strikes the ship and zaps the crate, causing a chemical reaction that releases the hallucinogen into the air. However, the gas seems to be denser than air given how it creeps along at ground level. So how would the gas spread throughout the upper level of the ship? All of the gas should stay here inside the cargo hold. Someone would have had to kill the doctor, drag his body into the sick bay past Joe who was unconscious on the bed, and then stuff the body inside the locker and leave without doing anything to Joe. Then lock the door from the outside even though the key is still on the dead doctor. Given the little information they have of what's going on, Joe and Charlie would have no reason to hide from a commanding officer. For all they know, the ship is under attack and he needs help fending off an enemy. Let me point out something to the devs. You can only do a jump scare once. It loses all effect afterwards since now the player is on guard for more. So save your jump scare for a good moment later in the game when the player's guard is down and they don't expect it. Charlie was behind Joe when they entered the cargo hold. Yet somehow Charlie entered first and then Joe discovers his body. I would assume that the gas causes people to hallucinate something they fear or are least familiar with. Charlie hallucinated the fortune teller. But Joe just sees a little kid running around. Why would he be so terrified of a child that he would open fire on a locker he saw one climb into? Since these hallucinations cause heart attacks in people due to terror, doesn't that mean everyone in the future games that appear in this Dark Pictures anthology should die of cardiac arrest when they encounter extreme terror in real monsters? Something tells me they won't. This radio operator is using Morse code when he has a perfectly good radio in the same room with him. Oh. I know Supermassive think they nailed it with Until Dawn, since this game is a copy-paste of Until Dawn except for a questionable multiplayer mode it could honestly do without, but that doesn't mean they couldn't make some improvements. Characters still walk through rooms like they're walking through knee-deep water. It takes way too much time and way too many button presses to look at an item, and they even recycle the theme song. After Telltale went under, you would think that would be a wake-up call to everyone else that resting on your laurels doesn't cut it. Also, let me just state that story-based multiplayer games lend themselves to neither a good multiplayer experience or a story. Hello, and welcome to my repository. The devs tried to cook up some weird fusion of early 2000s camp horror with an Alfred Hitchcock style presentation. Stories such as this one. All of the important information is in the middle of the book cliché. Since the game is introducing the cast with on-screen text that describes them, I figured I'd add a few descriptions myself. Fliss is introduced as first. Actually, let me add that to her character sheet. Due to this game really pushing for you to play this game in co-op, it can be hard to learn about every character or see the full chain of events that occur since the story will often be taking place in two different locations at once. I played this game in single player mode, and there were huge gaps in logic as well as how some characters even get to areas. And then I played through it again once I unlocked the curator's cut, which lets you play through those sections that would have been handled by player two. And you know what? It still didn't fill in the gaps. I hope Flynn didn't pay much for a fake diving instructor license if it has this many obvious misspellings and is written in English despite being issued in French Polynesia. Technically, we should call this in to port authorities as an unreported wreck. Well, technically. Are you sure you don't want to do this the right way? Fliss is big on following the rules. Rules like reporting a wrecked World War II airplane to the port authority, which would likely get her busted for running dives with a fake license. So, 
How did you figure it out? Everyone was just looking at where the plane was headed. But I asked myself, where was the plane from? You know, where was that airbase? So I made some guesses based on that hypothetical return flight, and I guess I guessed good. That is the first thing anyone would have done when searching for the plane. That's not clever. It's textbook. And how come only the missing plane is known about? I would think a missing ship and all the souls on board it would pique Brad's interest a lot more than a plane that went down while looking for it. And what's more, Brad spent all this time trying to find the plane crash, but was clueless about what the plane was doing out here when it went down. I have to keep track of the dive, but I'd be happy to continue this conversation later when I can give you my full attention. I've discovered through games that I would be a major slut had I been born a woman. The fishermen had a lot of room to get past them, but chose to drive right by the Duke of Milan, snagging the dive buoy. Look at our boat! We can take care of this man, it's not a problem. What do you think, like, uh, 10 bucks cover it? The game doesn't let you choose how to handle this situation, the event that sets everything in motion. And this probably would have worked had Conrad not thrown fistfuls of cash into the ocean and instead handed it to them like a normal human being. Now there's a shark? Yeah, come at me, shark! Wait, we have to decompress. The decompression side plot couldn't have been a good one had anything been done with it, such as have it gradually progress and force you to make tough decisions to keep Julia alive. But it only comes up again after the credits roll and kills Julia if she came up too fast and drank a beer. It really only exists to troll you. The rescue plane wrote Manchurian Gold on their flight report, which doesn't make any sense. The plane was dispatched due to a distress call from the freighter. They would not have known about the ship's secret cargo. People drown in these waters and you have to respect their resting place. Damn straight. Brad. You got a fun ghost story, right? Damn straight. Respect the local customs and the dead. Brad, tell us a ghost story to help us cope with this cultural misunderstanding. This story is true. It had happened right near here. I don't think anyone under the age of 60 actually does the ghost story thing anymore. This is a horror trope that is well past its time. Her husband did it. And he's still here. In the closet. Yeah. Marriage is a bitch, huh? Alex just proposed to Julia. Is that really the comment you want to make? Eyes bulge out and screams. How did Brad time that climax with the thunder? Somehow Brad hid under his bed and wasn't captured by the fisherman. I'm not sure how he managed that. He was in the bottom bunk below Conrad and they definitely grabbed him. At no point did he have time to hide under the bed. Why gag them? You're at sea. They can't very well yell for help. Don't let them see your hands. Alex just pounded on the door with his hands when they took Julia away to question her, and Junior looked right at Alex through the window. They should know that you undid the restraints. Junior fails to notice that none of them have duct tape over their mouths anymore. If you can distract them, I can get on that boat. The dude with the gun won't even realize until I'm long gone. Would Conrad even know how to navigate a boat with no electronic guidance during a storm? Get off our boat. Ah! Your boat? I'm the captain now. If I can resist using memes in a YouTube video, I expect professionally made games to resist using them as well. Which one of you is gonna tell me about this... Manchurian goo? With the way these characters were acting, disregarding laws and local customs, I kind of figured they were sowing the seeds of their own destruction through their hubris. They even decided to go looking for the Manchurian gold after finding the log, but Olsen makes a decision for them instead, meaning these kids are no longer willing participants, but forced to go along against their will, making the previous setup a waste of time. The freighter has remained anchored in place for over 70 years and no one has ever come across it before. This is despite the fact that it successfully radioed its position while the crew were still alive. Even if the rescue plane was shot down, the last known position would still be followed up on, especially after the plane failed to report back. Junior, retire la tête de l'image. At this point, the fishermen are making things harder for themselves. They believe they are going to find gold on this ship. Keeping captives makes that far harder. They should really just kill them and throw them in the ocean. Olsen, there is a port here! Okay, all of you, into the room. This is a military ship. You might want to check the room for weapons or a way out before you lock them inside of it. It takes both Conrad and Fliss to move the table to barricade the door. Junior is capable of pushing the door open by himself despite the table's weight and Conrad and Fliss holding it. How are there this many rats alive on a ship that has been rusting at sea for over 70 years? There can't be much left to eat after so long. Olsen doesn't notice the lantern light even in the dark cargo hold. Julia eventually closes the shade, but not before he should have seen it. That the distributor cap? From the Duke? We should grab it. Even though Olsen removed the distributor cap from Fliss's boat, the radio on it would still work. Why not give back to the boat and radio for help instead of risking your lives to retrieve the distributor cap? <laughs> At times, it feels like the game is trolling you with these decisions. What are we doing? I thought we were following them. We gotta keep our distance. This way we can get ahead of them. Let's hope it's faster. By following them, they run in the opposite direction hoping that it somehow gets them ahead of the fishermen. 
One of the four caskets loaded onto the ship in the prologue contains the remains of someone with two heads and a bloated skull. And this isn't an hallucination, since all three of them see it. But this is never explained and has no bearing with what's going on aboard the ship. You can't be scared by something when you are expecting it to happen. And with the amount of jump scares in this game, I am always on guard. Why so spick and span? The sick bay is clean with no damage from time or rot, which makes no sense and seems like something that would have an explanation, but none is ever given. Conrad, take a couple of these. Hey, where'd you go? Uh, looking for a second opinion? Conrad somehow gets separated from Julia and Alex. There were only two directions to go in, back the way they came and forward, and Conrad had no reason for going on ahead by himself. All right, come out! Show yourself! Maybe use that flashlight to illuminate the dark figure before rushing into the room. What was that? Considering these are hallucinations and not real spooks, how is Fliss hallucinating something she can't even see from her perspective? I retired the star wipe joke for jump scares a while ago, but this game is tempting me to bring it back. How is there still power in this ship? This is a diesel-powered freighter that's been anchored at sea for over 70 years. Yet there is still power in some areas and light bulbs haven't burned out. Did the hallucinations cause that door to slam shut and lock itself in order to separate Fliss and Brad? There's a reason why horror games tend to experience a resurgence every few years and then drop off the map for a while. And that's because horror gets repetitive quick. Typically, a developer will come up with a novel new approach to push the genre forward. And then other devs take notice and copy that innovation because usually the innovation is pretty easy to pull off. First, you had Resident Evil that was followed by several years of tank-controlled fixed-camera horror games. Then you had Amnesia and the flood of cheap indie horror titles all making you hide inside lockers from enemies you couldn't fight. And now we find ourselves in the PT era, where every horror game has to have a looping hallway that changes as you go down it multiple times. This kind of thing is only ever unsettling the first time you experience it. No one gets scared by a feature that has checked on a list. Fliss and Brad went through the same door and hallway, yet ended up on different levels of the cargo hold. This game better take place in the DC universe, because they ripped off Scarecrow's fear gas for this plot. How could an hallucinogenic gas fail to dissipate after 70 years? Even the Manchurian gold crystals in the bag would have had to degrade during that time. Getting a breath of fresh air is all it takes to clear the gas from your system and stop the hallucinations. However, the rescue aircraft that responded to the distress call 70 years ago was shot down by the men on board the ship while hallucinating. The guns are on the deck in the fresh air, so they should have been fine. And there should have been people on the deck when the gas leak started who were never affected, yet everyone still died that night. Also, people under the influence of a drug don't sober up just because they get some fresh air. The chemicals are already in your system once you start hallucinating, and would have to be broken down by your body first. I guess I'm supposed to be impressed by this twist, that the monsters aren't real, but the game was beaten to the punch by Scooby-Doo back in the 70s. The only way this is going to impress me now is if the Harlem Globetrotters show up to help. One thing I've noticed over the years of playing games that are built around life and death choices is that it doesn't really matter whether you keep the person alive or not. Even if they survive, you can expect their part in the story to be effectively over. They might get a line during a cutscene, but usually you will only see them stand quietly in a corner for the rest of the game while the characters with the remaining agency get to do things. Previously, Olsen was on the other side of the catwalk from Julia and Alex. As they try to cross it, he is somehow now behind them and breaks the catwalk with a hammer. Olsen is just a pirate. Why is he doing a slow Michael Myers walk towards his targets instead of running at them while they try to get away? Look, Insidious, or whatever that franchise is calling itself now, is already tired and worn out. You do yourself no favors by copying its style. I saw something. This, uh, uh, this old lady. But she just, like, up and vanished on me. Fliss doesn't speak up and mention to Conrad that she was chasing after him during the time he was freaking out and almost killed himself. So where'd all the corpses come from? They actually look like they've been scared to death. Yeah, about that. The hallucinations are so powerful that most of the crew died of heart attacks. Yet despite all the scary stuff they have experienced down here, none of them have died from cardiac arrest. Hold on. This ship's gotta have a radio. If we can find it and use it... The only thing more incredulous than looking for the ship's radio instead of using the one on Fliss's boat is that the ship's radio actually still works. Olsen turned the generator off, which killed the radio. Strangely, the below-deck lights still work. This generator has been running for 70 years without being refilled. So... The ship was carrying Manchurian gold, but that was really some sort of hallucinogenic bioweapon developed in China during World War II. We know it was unstable and leaked all over the ship. Maybe it's still here, and it's having the same effect on us. Just because they now know that what they're seeing isn't real doesn't mean they shouldn't still be affected by the gas. From here on out, the horror comes to an end with no further hallucinations. The rebreather. I bet the fisherman brought it from the Duke. The only thing the fishermen brought with them from Fliss's boat was the distributor cap. They didn't bring one of the rebreathers. The smug Americans have smashed their way into a foreign land. 
and come up short. You're in the middle of the Pacific on a US ship. What are you even ranting about? You can save Junior's life by stopping him from shooting himself and using the rebreather to get the gas out of him, but I don't see the point in doing so. Even he shrugs in confusion in the ending where he's still alive. <laughs> Fantastic. This just keeps getting better and better. It's a dead end. These two watched Olsen run off, but somehow they followed him into the wrong room. How does that even work? Conrad drops down the same hole Fliss and Alex went down to look for the generator, but somehow lands in a different part of the ship. Conrad should see Brett's body lying here in the cargo hold where Fliss killed him in my playthrough. His body isn't present until after Olsen is dead and Alex walks through and finds it. Olsen knocks open a bulkhead door and water spills out of it carrying Fliss. The last time we saw her, she stated she was not going to jump into the pool of water. I suppose this was one of those moments that works in two-player where she would, but in the single-player cut of the game, it goes unexplained. Fliss could see that Olsen had Conrad pinned right under the cargo door. Instead of pulling the lever to drop it and hoping Conrad can push Olsen off and get away, why not go help him directly? I swear I'm telling you everything I know. I didn't see Brad. There was this crazy guy in a hood. That's it. These two should be leaving Fliss on that ship in my playthrough. She killed both Alex's brother and Julia's brother. That's it. Game over. You're done. For now, at least. You could always try again, see if you can't do better next time around. So is this the good ending or bad ending? On one hand, a horror story where everyone survives has kind of missed the point of ramping up the stakes. On the other, game performance is usually judged on how well you did, and getting half the cast killed can't be seen as anything else but a screw-up. Till we meet again. Maybe in Little Hope, maybe somewhere else. Sequel baiting. They even stick the trailer at the end. <laughs> 